Welcome to the Bet US Soccer Channel Live Flash. It's, it's the Champions League, it's, it's the quarterfinals, it's the second leg. 18 goals in the first four games. We had two draws and two narrow wins. Atletico, the only home side winning, and Barcelona scoring free and winning free two in Paris. It's going to be absolutely bonkers these four games but first of all we are america's favorite sports book so i'd like you to subscribe and also i'd like you to ring the bell which means i'll notify you and you'll never miss any content again uh 16th of, of april, april. you want to make, make sure, sure that you join the uh, garrett, garrett wheeler, wheeler because it's going to be the mls show uh and everything obviously with the experts you're going to really enjoy that and if you want your odds your props your offers and your bonuses then type in betustv.com forward slash odds we're going to have chat you're going to be the ones that uh, do all the chatting and the typing and also want some predictions along the way as well there will be a QA and a because uh, obviously i think there's going to be so many questions but we are going to try and answer them as we cover all four games the uh i say we i've got the queen of sierra when i look down there seems to be a lack of italian uh teams i thought inter would have gone deep in this but uh, welcome, welcome to Mina Razuki and on the Premier League show is Marco here. Marco here, I'm going to come to you first. No way do we expect 18 goals in the first four games. No, no. The uh, the trend since the away goals rule was abolished has been for first leg matches to be quite tight, uh, quite close, quite competitive and quite low scoring as well. But that myth was completely bust out of the water last weekend, uh, last midweek, I should say. Yeah, 18 goals. I mean, all four of them were bangers in their own right, really, but all, all four matches. Um, I actually really enjoyed the Dortmund Atletico game, despite the, it being the, the lowest scoring of the three. Um, but also, I mean, you can't really sort of turn your nose up at the entertainment we had at Man City and Real Madrid and Arsenal and Bayern Munich for different reasons, too. So, And then Barca PSG was just brilliant fun, and I'm expecting something similar. Well, those two teams go again at it in Barcelona this midweek. So, yeah, it was, uh, I would say, well, I said to, to friends, I think it was the best four quarterfinal first legs of the Champions League I think I've probably ever seen as a batch, really. Um, just the standard was, was exceptional. The goals were brilliant. Uh, the drama, the entertainment was was uh, was there from the off, really. There were so many early goals. Um, you know, it was quite hard to kind of keep your breath. It was, it was just fantastic. Yeah, there was... Uh... It was one of them games where I thought the defending was nothing short of scandalous. Mina and ricochets and uh, deflections ended up in the back of the net. So, uh, Mina, what did you make of them first four? And do you think we're going to see the same again? Yeah, you're right about the deflections, but it is really just a collection of outrageous players just having shots and their individual quality really shining in these matches. It's interesting because I do feel like the last 16 was not that exciting but what it created was just these top teams going through to the quarterfinals where now they just take each other on and it's a show of the best quality players that you have right now in football um is it going to be the same on in the return leg i would say so because it's like you said defensively i don't think any team right now looks completely solid between these sides you can you look at PSG, you look at Barcelona, and both these teams are much better going forward than they are really getting back to defend. Um, you look at uh, Real Madrid, that was a that was probably the most tantalising match, as well as uh, Arsenal, who have been so capable at the back, of course, conceding that many goals to a Bayern Munich that everyone thought was uh, was really suffering and looked defeated. But these are the this is the Champions League. These are the stars with the experience, and they know how to show themselves. So, do I think it's going to be the same? Absolutely. I think we're going to be in for a lot of goals, but uh, I'm mostly excited about what's going to happen at Manchester City. Okay, okay well, let's kick off with the first, first game then, because the first, the first game, game is, is one of those where the only home side gets a victory. Now they go on the road and they get something to protect. It's Dortmund, plus 125, hosting Atletico at plus 205. Atletico and minus 145 to basically progress. Uh, plus half a goal, which is double chance. Uh, first leg, as you can see, was Atletico winning 2-1 in Spain. And the draw is at plus 260. The under over, they set at three, but the under is minus 135. I Meaning you can take this away because I don't know what Dortmund's turning up. It's one of those. Though, I don't think they can be wide open. I don't think they can go gun-ho because in the last time that they were at home against PSV, they could have been beaten by four or five. 
Well, you, you are absolutely right. You have no idea which side is going to show up. They've suffered only four league defeats this season in all competitions. But interestingly enough, they have been against very good sides, including, of course, Bayern Munich with the 4-0, 4-0 loss. They lost to RB Leipzig. They lost to Hoffenheim. And Stuttgart, who have an incredible coach and have really started to show us a different style of play that's super succeeding in Bundesliga at the moment. Having said all of that, we know that Atletico Madrid are a home side. They haven't yet shown us the best version of themselves away from home. If you look at that match against Inter, it's surprising that they managed to keep it uh, to a 1-0 because they looked so under the cosh for most of that match. And uh, and against Dortmund, you imagine them to really get a lead, but a 2-1 is perhaps not ideal for them. They should have had a at least a two-goal difference to take back to Germany because this is going to be difficult. Dortmund have been impressive at the back. Usually they have been so open, but these days it's it's they did manage to keep Eindhoven to a 2-0, kept a clean sheet at home. You look at their recent matches um, and... There have been some improvements at the back, but it's just a different type of Dortmund that really do believe in themselves. Uh, That evidenced by the fact that, like I said, they've only lost four home games. It's about whether or not we can see the best from Griezmann. Um, I thought, you know, in the first half, it was all Atletico Madrid, but their adjustments allowed them to get that goal back. And there was improvements from Dortmund in the second half. Can Atletico show us the best version of themselves away from home? They are reliant on on what their midfield can do, whether their defence can actually be rock solid to stop the attack from Falkenberg and and Sancho and uh, and Sebastian Aller. So that's going to be something that we need to look out for. In all honesty, though, Dortmund probably have the upper hand in all of this. Um, Atletico Madrid on paper, perhaps the better side and the one that we all expect to to go through. But if this was reversed in the sense that Atletico played away first and then at home, then I would have told you it's with Atletico. But the way that Dortmund have been playing, they got that win over the weekend. It's very difficult to not think that they could do something special playing in in front of the yellow wall. No, totally agree. The big thing is here, Mark. By the way, um, if you can just give me some feedback on my sound. Uh, People are saying that my mic volume is very low. I struggle to put a plug on, but if the producer wants me to start messing about with a few buttons to get my mic level up, then uh, just fire away, Kev. You just let me know if you uh, need me to do anything. Uh, Mark O'Hare, is this a both teams to score an over? Because we know that Mm. Dortmund have got to take the game to Atletico. They've got to score twice because... I don't see them keeping a clean sheet, but we've said that so many times about Dortmund and they've kept a clean sheet by hook or by crook. Mm, this is this is the one I found most difficult in finding a real bet I wanted to hang my hat on, really, because the first leg was a little bit confusing. I mean, we expected Atletico to go for the jugular from the off, really, and they did. They, they hassled and harried and hounded Dortmund into making those really sort of uh, childish mistakes in the first 30 minutes or so. They look like rabbits in the headlights. And, you know, Gregory Cobell, who's been brilliant between the sticks, was was off colour. So was Mats Hummels, someone very, very experienced, and Schlotterbeck as well. But, uh, you know, once they sort of found their feet, and I think the second half, whether it was complacency, fatigue, or or something tactical from Atletico, they, they just weren't able to sort of put their foot on Dortmund's throat in that second half and, and kill off the tie. And, you know, Haller comes on, um, gets that vital, vital goal, but they hit the woodwork twice after the consolation. So Dortmund are actually coming into this feeling really good about themselves, feeling like they can actually go and complete the job in 90 minutes. And Edin Terzic was very enthusiastic after that match in Madrid. And um, you can understand why, really. They've lost just once in the last 17 home Champions League matches. Uh, The last defeat came in November 2021 in Europe at home, which is very impressive. And We've said a few times that Atletico Madrid, for whatever reason, it's chalk and cheese between the home and away performances. Just five wins on their travels in La Liga this season, just one in four in Europe. And that was fairly fortuitous when you look at the goals in that final match. If you go back further, they played 30 away Champions League ties and lost 15 times. And the majority of those are more group stage games than knockouts as well. Just six clean sheets in that same 30 game sample. So, you know, for whatever reason, Atletico can't seem to be able to translate their home record onto the road be it domestically or in Europe. So, um, yeah, I'd be looking at Dortmund here if I had to be involved. I think minus a quarter is a a potential, close to plus 100. And I think that's fair enough, really. 
Um, I think they will be at it from the off and I think they will put the pressure on. I think they'll rack up a load of corners and I think they'll put Atletico Madrid under under pressure. It's a shame that Sebastian Haller looks like he might miss out. He, he hit a, got a really big knock at the weekend uh, against Gladbach, so he's rated doubtful really. But uh, he is the kind of presence, I think, who could unsettle Atletico Madrid, whether from the off or, or off the bench, either or. So, uh, And Samuel Lino suspended for Atletico Madrid. I think he will be a big loss for them down that left-hand side. Um, so, yeah, I think this is uh, very, very interesting. It could go the distance, really. So if you do want to get Dortmund on side, I would perhaps look at Dortmund to win by exactly one goal, which will then guarantee extra time. And then from there, you might want to get involved with uh, penalties or, or whatnot, because I I don't see Dortmund running away with it. But um, I also don't see this game escalating into a, an all-out shootout. I just think Atletico, we're going to see Simone go back to the old school playback playbook of... Uh, being or trying to be difficult to beat on the travels by sitting in a low block and, and playing on the counter attack, which they can do, of course, but um, we'd rather they didn't. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so we... I think it's going to go all the way. You can get plus 900 for either of the sides to uh, go through on penalties. I mean, I think that this has got a little bit of a 2 1 about it. I think the first 20 minutes are going to be absolutely vital because we see that about Dortmund. They come out, they set their stall out, and they set the tempo. The other side of it is, I like, this game could get a little bit spiteful because I'm I know that Atletico Madrid, being two one up, are going to try and break up any type of rhythm uh, that Dortmund try to uh, like with momentum. I think they'll just keep breaking it up. Um, I don't I don't I don't have enough trust in Dortmund to win this game. I think that Atletico will avoid defeat, uh, and I hope they do as well. Uh, let's have a little look at the official picks of game number one because I'm on my own, and I just really uh, that is not like a, a normal uh, flash pick, but Atletico double chance minus one forty five. You're giving me two results. Um, I think it could be a mirror image of the first leg, but I think Atletico have got too much on the break. So uh, good luck to the uh, Spaniards. Let's move on to game number two, though. Two absolute giants of European football here. Barcelona, plus 128. Don't need to win. The draw is their friend. It's 145. Draw no bet, Barcelona. PSG at plus 192, but plus 125 with draw no bet. The first leg, as you can see at the bottom, 3-2 to Barcelona. The draw is at plus 293, which again... Would uh, would suit the home side. I think PSG here, Marco here, scored twice. Minus 110. Whether that's good enough. Is this, is this got a little bit of a 2-2 two -two all about it? Because it will go for the full 95 minutes. Yeah, difficult to not assume we'll see something similar from last week again this time around. Um, obviously, the venue, the Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, isn't as intimidating for PSG as perhaps the Camp Nou could be, but I have to admit, I was disappointed with PSG last week. Disappointed with the team selection, the tactical approach again. And Luis Enrique is he's done this a few times in the Champions League. I remember the, the trip to Newcastle in the group stage in particular when he's kind of thrown a few wobblies with his team selection. And, and it's not really worked out. You know, Marco Asensio was pretty anonymous in that first leg. Obviously, there was no Hakimi, so they had to sort of switch around the defensive system to uh, no Zaire Emery. So, I'm expecting some of the big boys to come back, or even the youngsters. <laughs> they're, they're so <laughs> talented. Um, but um, Hakimi is back, which I think is a, a big, big plus. He'll slot in at right back, and his attacking thrust down that side will give them plenty going forward and a recovery pace as well um, to cut out uh, Rafinha. Um, but also, I think uh, it allows Marquinhos to slot into centre-half again. And I think they will look a bit more rounded this time around. I was disappointed with them. Um, they didn't get a huge amount of opportunity into Kylian Mbappe to cause Barcelona problems. Barca deserve plenty of praise, of course, for their performance too. Uh, but it was only really that sort of 20-minute spell after half-time when I felt PSG were in the ascendancy. And then Barca bring off Pedri, bring on Pedri from the bench and you know, it's game over, such as his ability. But Barca have got a couple of problems this week. Um, Christensen and Sergio Roberto both suspended. Um, Pedri isn't 100%. So they're looking like they're going to try and partner De Jong and Gundogan in a more sort of holding role pivot, if you like, uh, in the midfield three to provide the protection because Pedri's legs aren't quite there yet. So he'll be given a more advanced role. I think you're losing a bit from Gundogan playing him in that role. Um, and without a, a really sort of rock solid holder um, or destroyer, um, they could be put under pressure here. So eager to see how the two teams line up. But um, yeah, I think Barca have the ability, of course, to, to cut any team to shreds when those forward players are at, at their best. Uh, and I think they will get opportunities here because surprisingly or not, um, 
PSG, their defensive numbers in Ligue 1 are shockingly bad, um, especially away from home. So on their travels, they're giving up the fourth highest expected goals figure away from home in Ligue 1, which is just astonishing for a team of, of their sort of dominance and power in that division. Uh, and that would cause me concern if I'm back in PSG here. So I think the most sensible play here is just to support goals in some way or form. So I'm going to have both teams to score. A uh, fairly obvious play, really. But I'm going to partner it with over three and a half cards. And it comes in at minus 120, which I think is a really nice play. We know that second leg knockout ties, the uh, chance of goals tends to increase. And so does the cards. And we've got a really good referee here, Istvan Kovacs. He's Romanian. He's a bit of a taskmaster. Uh, he's averaging just shy of five cards per game in his Champions League career. That's excluding qualifiers. And this season, he's taken charge of five Champions League ties in four of those He's given at least four cards, which includes the last 16 first leg game between Inter and Atleti, where he brandished six. We're just looking for four to get the bounty alongside both teams to score. So that would be my play. Okay, what is, what is the, the line? line for cards? Uh, just if you want to leave goals and money line and uh, outcomes alone. I mean, I mean uh, it'll so be so at least four and a half. Probably five. You think four and a half. OK. Um, at least, And yeah. also, just before I go to Mina, do you think that this is another game that potentially could go to penalties? Possibly, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I, you see, you can see PSG scoring twice. I can see Barcelona scoring twice. We could get a 2-2 here. And yeah, pens on, on the cards. But um, it, I, I kind of swerved this match last week because I couldn't really sort of nail my colours to be the team. And I still feel the same way. I think there's flaws um, and positives in both teams, but so I'd rather just kind of support both sides to score and not really care about the result. And I do fancy cards though. Yeah, but if I'd have told you that Barcelona were going to win 3-2 in Paris, you'd have had me locked up and the men in white coats would have, would have just <laughs> not... They wouldn't even have knocked on the door. They would have feared for my safety and my mental health. Talking of mental uh, health. Not as much as back in Man United away at Bournemouth flash, but we'll, <laughs> we'll save that for Thursday. <laughs> Yeah, a push a push. You got Aston Villa fair play. You push banker though. Fair play. Yeah, I, I did. I went, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Mina, Barcelona versus PSG. Barcelona gonna obviously try and put them on the front foot, or do they then just revert and say, look, we're already in the lead here? And the one thing about PSG is they do struggle to break down a low block. Yes, I, I'm not sure that I would take that approach for the simple sake that Kylian Mbappe, you don't need to give him many chances and he can make the difference. And that's the that's the point that was made in the in the first leg between these two sides, was that he didn't really make the difference. He wasn't really offered the service required to make the difference. And Donnarumma made mistakes to see them concede that they have, which was quite surprising, really, because the, the goalkeeper was was, uh, well, Luis Enrique spoke very highly of Don Roma coming up to this match about how he's grown into a leader and how important he is for the defence. And yet he made all these mistakes with lots of the fans demanding whether or not this is the goalkeeper they need that can make the difference. So possibly a mistake there to happen from him? I don't know, because he really showed that he suffers from the crosses. And I think that overall, on a tactical level, uh, it was Xavi that outplayed Luis Enrique. This is a grudge match between the two because uh, Luis Enrique doesn't feel that he ever got the the compliments that he deserved for the trouble that he won at Barcelona, for really showing the Barcelona philosophy. And he's doubled down on the fact that he's the man that has always understood the Barcelona philosophy and shows that day in and day out. And yet he was outplayed and, out and outmastered by Xavi in that match. I mean, the substitutions really worked well. We saw what Pedri could do. It seemed like every time a sub came on, it was going to be something to do with Barcelona were going to get another goal. Um, it was fantastic to watch. At home in the Champions League, they haven't lost so far this season, Barcelona. Um, as for PSG, we've seen what happened against Newcastle and against Milan. But recently in their away matches, they have proved fantastic. They won eight of their last nine away matches. Of course, it's different to play Liga than it is to play in the Champions League. I just can't imagine that we're going to keep Mbappe silent for this. It's so difficult at the moment to see which side can really go through. It's about the midfield. Um, it's about Gundogan and Pedri and, and who, whoever it is that's going to play there. But they seem to be stronger at the moment, certainly than what we saw in the first leg. So I would say that Barcelona could dominate play. It's about converting those chances and making the most of them. PSG sometimes just look very 
fractured. You don't know where it's going to come from. But I agree with Mark. Ashraf Hakimi coming back is going to show a lot of attacking onus. And is they're going to be so vertical, which is something that could really hurt Barcelona, especially if you look at the matches that they have lost playing at, uh, at home this season. In 2024, though, they haven't lost at all. So it's going to be interesting to see because they really have improved ever since Xavi announced that he was going to be leaving. My, my money is on Mbappe. We're talking about the best player in the world right now. And I think that being kept quiet for the first leg, being so well caged by, uh, by Xavi and his men was, was interesting. I think that it compliments to them for managing to do that. But there's only so much you can do against the best player in the world. So my money is on him to make the difference. He will feel the responsibility of, responsibility of that. He has heard the criticism being laid squarely on him. So I think this is going to be... The, te- the man that will make the difference. Um, also, because I am worried that with Barcelona keeping possession, there's always going to be the option of the counter-attack. So when you when you do have Dembele, you have now Ashraf Hakimi, and you've got uh, Mbappe, then I think it's going to be difficult to keep him quiet. So anytime goal scorer, that's one way to go for it. I think this is a game that's going to be lots of goals. You don't, you really can't trust either side to keep a clean sheet in this one. So either both teams to score in over two and a half um Kylian Mbappe, anytime goal scorer. That's the way that I look at it. Yeah, yeah. the SG uh, team total over one and a half is also around the minus one ten. But there's other, there's so many players on the pitch that have got actual uh, answers to uh, questions to be answered. Uh, producer, a bit quick there. When yeah, did I ask for them picks? Did I? Did I ask for the official picks to be up there? Did I? Kev. We've got a new producer today. Kev, he's a great lad. Loves it. He's making his debut on the Soccer Channel. Um, Kev. Can I have them picks, please? Kylian Mbappe, anytime scorer at plus 110. PSG, team total over one and a half at minus 110. Both teams scoring over three and a half cards at minus 120. Remember, the Romanian referee loves cards. And uh, maybe if we can... uh, Mark O'Hare, would you go... If it was over four, four and a half, would you go over? I think it would be closer to a five card line, if not higher, probably with him in charge. Okay, Okay. Uh, Uh, Gineppi. uh, Also, before we go on to the next game, Gineppi says uh, about Henrique. uh, Obviously, that is Luis Enrique's cousin. Uh, Okay, just to obviously give you a little bit of uh, a little little bit bit of of, uh, knowledge there. Um, Also, he says Hakimi loves to assist his best friend Mbappe. Uh, Yeah, listen, we love Hakimi, love Mbappe, and Dembele should be shining as well. It's going to be a great game. So, whatever way you go, let's hope it's the same fireworks as leg one. Let's move on to game number three. Okay, Manchester City, Real Madrid. Last week it ended three three. Uh, I thought it was, I thought defenses were shocking for both sides. Man City are now minus one fifty five, getting them back to the Etihad. Real Madrid a plus three eighty. Real Madrid double chance is plus money and good plus money as well at plus one thirty five. The first leg showed us neither sides are happy defending. Real Madrid go two one up with two deflections. Then they sit back and just say to Man City. Uh, you can have the ball, you can have chances, you can have shots, and then find themselves 3-2 down. Then Man City drop back and say to Real Madrid, I think they both got it wrong, but Man City will be the happier of the two, Mina. Yeah, Man City. Um, this is a this is a tie between two great home teams who haven't lost the season playing at home. So ideally, we're looking at both both home wins, but Real Madrid couldn't get the win. It was the most fantastic match that you'll ever see in the Champions League. It was ridiculously good. I mean, the level of talent, the the, the goals that we saw, I mean, there were deflections, but Valverde's goal was something, I mean, it's ridiculous. More importantly, was Foden and the way that he really showed his understanding, his tactical intelligence, his movement, and the way that he can make a difference against what is a very good Real Madrid team at home? So this is becoming the derby of Europe, in all honesty. And uh, I did tell you guys last week that this is a game in which you almost always see a lot of goals. This is a team that has such ridiculous individual talent that there's always going to be a moment of brilliance from one of those players, whether it's Bellingham or Foden or Vinny Jr. or anyone, really. Um, we've got Chalmini missing for this one. He's suspended. Of course, they'll also be without... Um, Alaba and Courtois. You've only got uh, Stones, who's got an injury, which means that Kyle Walker is back. This is going to be very interesting uh, as well, because there's always that battle with Haaland and Rudiger. City Brilliant. have... 
<laughs> I know, right? It's the best matchup that we've got. Um, City have scored at least two goals in their last four home matches against Real Madrid, and you expect that that continues in this match as well. So we're looking at a bunch of goals, and especially coming from City, they were able to rest the likes of Rodri, who'd complained about being uh, a little bit tired. And, looked uh, it, though, didn't he? Did look looked tired. It. Absolutely. And yet, could you know, the team doesn't need him. Still managed to get five goals against uh, Luton. It all looks so easy, especially with them now two points ahead in the in the uh, in the Premier League. They're looking confident. They understand that they were capable to go to the Bernabeu and score three goals. They are top spot right now in the Premier League. So confidence is reigning high and you're really starting to see how experience makes the difference. This is no longer a team that shies away from any contest or any battle and certainly feels that they're capable of taking on Madrid. I find it really hard to go against Madrid because we're talking about the two best coaches. Uh, if Pep is to win this edition of the Champions League, he will match Carlo Ancelotti for the amount of Champions League trophies that he has. So we're talking about the best two most experienced coaches in the Champions League. Usually it's the team that plays at home that wins. Uh, this is so difficult to go with this because it's either Real Madrid managed to come through this and get their first and be the first team to defeat City at home or we, it goes as planned as we imagined and City will take this one. Do we see this being a draw and going into extra time? Anything's possible because what Madrid know how to do is play till the final whistle and they don't seem to give up at all. So there is an, always that fear with City that when they do concede, it happens one after another. So that's something that we need to look out to. I believe once again that this is going to be all goals in this side. I would back City to score at least two goals um, and I would back Madrid to get one. So either both teams to score an over two and a half or, of course, team total for City to be over two. Um, in all honesty, I think they could get three in this. So it's going to be a very fun match. Uh, looking to see which tactician manages to get the best out of it. Yeah, I just don't fancy uh, Madrid's midfield yep. here. I think that they've got to go back. I mean, Rudiger, yeah, best player on the pitch last week. But there again, he was marking nobody. And Man City went to Real Madrid, scored three with 10 men. Uh, because obviously Haaland didn't turn up again, Marco, here. Um, I just... Well, it, the, 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 the thing, thing is, is, if you actually watch the way he plays, I mean, Rudiger had him in his pocket and he just kept checking and saying, are you all right in there? Are you OK? Because he had nothing, didn't contribute in the whole 95 minutes. Uh, Marco here, do we go over three goals in the game at minus 109? Both teams to score and over or just not complicate it. Minus 155, Man City win. They've been labelled the best side in the world now. They've just got to win over 90 minutes to take another step closer. And remember, they are the Champions League favourites as well. Yeah, they're on for the, the double treble, um, if you like. And yeah. it looks pretty ominous at this stage. Uh, yeah, I'd back them to progress here uh, in 90 minutes. You think of the City team that went to Madrid, scored three goals and competed pretty well. Well, they're going to be better on paper going into this game as Carl Walker is back and Kevin De Bruyne is fit. Of course, he was ill before the first leg, so didn't feature from the off. And um, I think City will look uh, a much stronger unit with those players. Fit and available, I think Walker is far better able to deal with the counter-attacks and transitions of Real Madrid, who did seem to target the right-hand side of City's defence quite significantly in that match with the, all the balls going down that way. They started Rodrigo down that side, which is a bit of a, a cunning move from Ancelotti, and, and City struggled to deal with it, really. But, um, you know, with Walker there, I think they have got that recovery pace, and with De Bruyne available, um, you know, he's one of the best players in the world. So they're clearly going to be a better side for it. And yeah, a couple of concerns of Real Madrid. Uh, Mina mentioned in Schumann's suspension. Um, Militao hasn't really been rushed back from injury. It's been out for a while. So he's not going to be, you know, match fit, if you like. Or it's Nacho, who's had a, a pretty poor 2024. So they're not down to the bare bones at centre-half, but they're two players who they probably don't really want to choose between either. And they would have preferred to have Schumann available. And as you say, no, no Alaba, no Courtois. Um, they are a weaker team than the side who came here 12 months ago. I know there's Bellingham in the squad. I know the young boys have, have got another year on their belts too. But um, I think individually they are a weaker team that went to the Etihad and got trounced last year. I do not expect it to be anywhere near as comprehensive as, as last season when these two teams played each other. But I do think City will come out on top um, just because of that. The 
the Etihad is, is such a fortress these days, uh, not in terms of a, a cauldron atmosphere, but just, as you say, Fash, they are the best team on the planet right now. And going away there and, and winning is so difficult. And this is a side who's now scored at least three goals in all nine of their Champions League games this season. So to score three, three at Real Madrid, you know, they can at least score three again here at the Etihad. And that's going to be very difficult to kind of... Uh, compete with but I do think Madrid can absolutely get on the score sheet um, Guardiola said so in his post-match press conference actually mm. he said he expects Real Madrid to score um, and I don't disagree actually because City can't be trusted to keep clean sheets it's just two and seven home league games now one home clean sheet and four Champions League outings this season as well and I do think you look at that Real Madrid side they're just geared to plan the counter-attack and transitions with the, some incredibly quick pacey tricky players in forward areas and City have struggled you know at times this season when the ball is broken down in midfield and they've been caught on the counter domestically and on the continent too so I think we can absolutely see Real Madrid getting on the score sheet here but I agree with Mina I think Man City can score two or three here quite comfortably and uh for that reason, I looked at the prices and City, you said, what, minus 155? I think the BTTS price is around something similar. So the market's basically saying there's a, at least a 60% chance, if not more, of Man City winning and both teams scoring as, as sort of single selections here. So I think why not yeah. just combine the two? You're getting plus 225, which is a huge increase on the Man City price. Uh, and the market's saying it's got less than a 30% chance of landing. Doesn't really add up, up to me, really, when you consider the the quality on both sides and what we saw last week too. So, yeah, I'm pro City, uh, but I'll back the bigger price, Man City to win and both teams to score. Yeah, yeah. and the other way you've got to look at this game is that obviously Madrid will not want to be going behind uh, early, so they're going to have to sit back. That's how they handed the initiative back to City at home last week. So you have Rodrigo, you've got Vinny, you've got Bellin. None of them three want to be back foot sitting in front of the back line that's got holes in it as well. So for me, I think that Man City lead at half time. I think Man City come out and they stamp all over them. They've got fresh legs now as well. The better squad is with the home side. And the only way, and the problem you're going to have here is that if Madrid do go behind, then they're going to have to come forward and then that's going to play into Man City's hands as well. Um, let's have a little look at the official picks because Man City are still the favourites for the Champions League and nothing we saw last week is going to deter anyone to not think that that is the case. Both teams to score an over 2.5 is plus 105. Man City to be leading at half-time is plus 126. And Man City and both teams to score plus 225. Brings in that 3-1, one, 4-1. One. Uh, be happy if it's 3 0 uh, with like, two minutes to go and they get a goal. Don't want, uh, I don't mind that heart fluttering from you, Marco, here, as long as I'm leading at half time. Uh, OK, let's move on to the final game. OK, I'm going to come to you first, uh, Marco, here. But Mina already said Bayern Munich just to go through was plus 150. They went to Arsenal and the old Bayern turned up because Bayern's strengths, when they're at it, is up against Arsenal's weak weaknesses Week in, week out. And it's their fullbacks against Bayern's wingers. Bayern are now plus 139. They're going to exploit them fullbacks. Arsenal are plus 179. The under over set at three with the under being at minus 118. The draw is at plus 271. Marco here, I just look at Bayern here and think, here's your opportunity to right all the wrongs that have gone on in Bundesliga all season. And if we see an Arsenal side that went to Portugal and didn't have a shot on goal, then Bayern go through and they win at plus 139. Yeah, so I looked at this game, you know, last week I talked up Arsenal. Um, the price had gone by the time we went live and, and talked about the game, but I was still pretty confident in Arsenal. Up until kickoff, really, on Tuesday, the price on Arsenal had collapsed, really. They went off incredibly short to win that game. And the closer we got to kickoff, the more I kind of felt less confident about the position I was in, even if it was a high value position. And that was because I sort of looked at the buying team sheet, the abundance of obvious quality in that squad, plus the fact they are in almost last chance saloon this season because they'd clearly written off the Bundesliga title a couple of weeks back. Um, so they were obviously a dangerous animal. And then they produced one of the best performances of the season. Probably not massively surprising, but I did think Arsenal contributed to that too because defensively, the side of it's looked rock solid all, all year, really. Just looked incredibly jittery at times. And the, the same sort of concerns against Porto read their ugly heads. And they looked uneasy against the counter-attack. Made some very uncharacteristic sloppy errors. And generally just looked uncomfortable um, against Harry Kane, who 
basically schooled the two centre halves and brought the others into play. Um, but you know, I would be and want to be pro Bayern for a couple of reasons. But I have to be held back because of the team news. Um, Alfonso Davies is suspended. He hasn't been at his best this season, but that is a blow when you've got Rafael Guerrero as a replacement. Serge Gnabry is out. Kingsley Coman is out. Leroy Sane is a doubt. So that's three of your speedsters on the flanks, yeah. who two of which were ex- excellent at the Emirates, who could be missing for this game. And that's a, a massive blow for, for Bayern. Look, they've still got plenty of quality. Kane is world-class. Musiala is on the way to being world-class too. Muller um, has shown glimpses this season. He's still got it too. So I don't want to discount Bayern on that, but it's definitely a big blow. The flip side is, you know, Arsenal, difficult to know where they're at right now. Um, it might be reactionary after what we saw on Sunday, but for that second half, they look laboured against Aston Villa. Whether it's mental, physical fatigue, um, it has come during a relentless spell. Of course, the Premier League schedule is, is much tougher than the Bundesliga, so Bayern will be much more well-rested than, than Premier League sides. But since February, they've had to play Bayern, Porto twice, Liverpool and City, as well as Aston Villa. Um and you know, seven other matches too. So it's been a busy period and they just looked leggy. They were very, very good in that first half against Villa, but just didn't seem to be able to to keep that pace up in that second half. And I look at key individuals like that centre-half pairing of Gabriel and Saliba. Um, they've been making a few sloppy decisions. Declan Rice hasn't been quite at himself. The fullbacks have looked weak in recent weeks too. So, you know, I just wonder whether Arsenal's season is starting to collapse a little bit, but that might just be a reaction to what I saw in that second half. And I don't want to sort of cloud my judgment based on 45 minutes. So um, my way into this game and the way I feel most comfortable is to back goals again, because I think Rob Bayern so rarely blank, especially in Munich. They do have uh, unbelievable players in forward positions despite those injuries. However, I wouldn't trust Bayern to keep a clean sheet against almost any side in the world right now. They've conceded against... Uh, fourth division opposition this season, some of the worst teams in the Bundesliga. Um, and that partnership of De Ligt and Eric Dyer at centre-half does not fill me with confidence whatsoever. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, this is a massive cliche, but the first goal is massively key. And whichever way it goes, I think we could, and whichever time it comes in, um, this could explode. But ultimately, I think Arsenal will go there with a game plan to be pragmatic but whether they're capable of doing so and keeping Bayern out remains to be seen. I would suggest they will concede. But I also back Arsenal to score too, so therefore I'll back overs and BTTS at uh, minus 120. Yeah, Davis, Gnabry, Sane. If they're all out, if, because you know that obviously until the lineups, there's a lot of chess, there's a lot of mental games that go on. Um, I mean, I'm, it's only their pace. It's not that they're defensive uh, prowess. It's all about the pace because, again, Aston Villa showed Arsenal up again in them corner and fullback areas. And that's exactly what Bayern need to do again. It is a bit of a leveller if they're all out and all of a sudden we've only got pace down the centre of the pitch because Arsenal's spine is probably one of the best in Europe. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to jump ship yet, uh, Mina. Saliba booking might be on the plate, says Mitch. Uh, yeah, listen, as the tighter the game get, gets, the longer it goes on, the more chance you've got of players uh, diving in and putting their foot in. Declan Rice might well, Mina. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one. I have to agree with Don there, who said that, you know, they seem to be a little bit on a losing streak. You felt real anxiety watching them play against Aston Villa at home. After that first half, you thought, OK, that they're not converting their chances. Lots of made, was made about Kai Havertz and the position that he was played, whether or not he should really be in midfield when he's been so good when being played up front. But it was it was about the general atmosphere, you felt like the longer they went without scoring a goal, the negative energy started to sap away at them and they weren't able to provide the performance that we expect from them. Aston Villa grew more and more um, into the game once they started to see that they could really get something from here. And that's all they need to depend on. I think this has been the question that we've had of Arsenal is when it comes to the business end and the pressure is on and you're now chasing and you need to win those matches when everyone's expecting you to win those matches, can you really show the best form? And it's difficult to ask for a lot of these players who haven't potentially played at the very highest level. Um, they are still an experience. It's still a lot of great players who, who are young, um, barring a few. So it, it's about really taking that jump 
and taking that leap to play against the Stars. A lot was said about the fact that, you know, well, it's Porto, they play, you know, very defensive football, so it's very difficult for Arsenal to break them down. And against an open team like Bayern, they will get a lot more opportunities. Sure, they did, because Dyer and De Ligt aren't the best. Um, and yet I still think they were capable of, of keeping away a, a, an attacking lineup that is good, but is not brilliant, because they are missing that great striker. I think they've all managed to find goals. They've been perfect from set pieces. But I think in these very big matchups against teams that are so experienced and, and, and have players of the highest level, it becomes difficult. They were open on the counter-attack. So actually against a team that does play ball, they also showed a lot of their deficiencies and it still seemed like the negative energy got to them and the experience got to them and they now look devoid of energy and as well as confidence. A draw against Bayern, a loss against Villa, where now they're wondering whether or not they can win the Premier League and whether a chance has gone again. I don't know. It makes me think that I'd rather stay with Bayern. But I have to agree with Mark because we are talking about some big absences there for Bayern. I think most importantly is the absence of Nabry. I think he was the man that would have made a huge difference. Why, why is he out? Why is he out, Mina? <sighs> Injury. Well, well see, that's, that's what I'm saying. One. I don't believe he's injured until I see that lineup and he's not playing. But And Komen, why is Komen out? Injured again? Nab he got it, injured at the weekend. Yeah, yeah it's because they ruled both of them out. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. the weekend that ruled both of them out, yeah. I, I, I believe that when I see it. Uh, I agree, to... by the way. I think there's a potential that we can see. I definitely think Sane is going to play. And I think he was the most dangerous because you really saw how hard it was for them to try to, to cope with Sane's ability there. So it's, it's about that. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see because they're playing at home. So I wonder whether the tactics will be the same. But I have to say that I do believe in Tuchel because we're talking about last chance to noon. This is the time to make a difference. We've already seen by Leverkusen cheer on the fact that they've won their first title. We know it's out of, uh, 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 we know that Bayern can't win it. We know that they're so down in the dumps after having won it for 11 years, that this is their only opportunity for a trophy. This is their only opportunity to make a difference and not have this be a shocking season for them. So against Arsenal, against an, an Arsenal side that is so low on confidence at the moment and haven't been the brilliant away from home, in all honesty, in front of a crowd that's going to be so pro Bayern. I, I'm sorry, I can't see it. I went for Bayern to qualify out of this and to reach the semi-finals. I'm going to stick to the bet that I made last year, last week. Um, I, I will always choose experience. I'm just interested to know how they'll make up for the lack of pace in the team and whether or not we are going to see Sane start this match and uh, if we at all going to see um, Nabry in this. Yeah, yeah lineup line check. check. It's, it's a lineup line check for uh, one million percent. I want to be with a home side all the way. But let me just throw a little bit of balance here because if this was Man City versus Bayern, I think Man City would score four. So again, Arsenal need to find that positive attitude, at home or away. Home, home or away. away. I watch, watch Bayern. Bayern every game. Every single game, they have been tortured at the back. I mean, yeah. they they've been tortured. Now, but they can score yeah. goals. Even against yeah, City, even if they're, they're counter-attacking got... against City, who haven't had... I mean, oh, they've drawn... Those... Different levels. I thought Leroy, Leroy Sane epitomised Bayern's season uh, in terms of a guy who started pretty well and then just went off the boil for about six months. <laughs> but then the biggest <laughs> match of the season, months. he just Shut comes to the party and, <laughs> and plays absolutely yeah. un wonderfully well at the Emirates. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, exactly. You're such 25 a... games gap. I watch every minute of every game in that Bundesliga, right? And I'm telling you now, they I knew it was coming. I knew it because they they go through the motions. It's almost like, oh, it's the Champions League, it's a world. I tell you what it looked like. They were in the shop window. Look at us. We can perform on this stage. Come and get us. Because at the moment, Bayern with two call, I know he's going, they looked absolutely scandalous. Nine and a half out of ten weeks. I've seen them go two nil up in games, and the old Bayern went on and scored eight. They get beat. They get beat against like Bundesliga newcomers. They can't keep clean sheets for love nor money. So yeah, listen, maybe Bayern to win. Penalty, to score. Do we see Arsenal potentially giving away a penalty? There's going to be a penalty in the game. There's only one player who's going to be uh, stepping up to take it, and it's Harry Kane because he loves a penalty against Arsenal. Loves a penalty. So Should again, there have been two last week? I mean, Tuchel was complaining yeah, about one. Saka was complaining about one. How, how does FIFA or UEFA not step in and, and see things like that? I mean, we have about VAR. Has VAR not got in his ear and gone, 
are you actually watching the game? The lads picked the ball up, took the laces out of it, and put it back down. It's like, come on now. Uh, okay, was Saka's yeah. a penalty there? No, of course it weren't. He boot, in fact, it was a yellow card for Saka for booting Neuer. Neuer stood there and didn't do anything. Planted, if it was basketball, it was an offensive charge. Okay, because Neuer came, stood, and then he dipped the ball, and his leg, his leg was nine yards away from the rest of his body. So, no, Saka should have been booked for booting uh, Neuer. I think the referee got that exactly right. Uh, let's have a look. What a game this is, isn't it? This is mm. what the Champions League's all about. These nights in uh, in Munich. Uh, and Arsenal have got a rebound, by the way, because if they feel sorry for themselves, step up your leaders, please. Leaders, now step up. Because Odegaard's been brilliant. They've all been brilliant. The two boys at the back have been the best defensive partnership in the whole uh, whole of Europe, not if not world, world football. And yet, they let in two last week. Could have been four. Got beat at the weekend. Got run ragged. Let's have a little look at the official picks, please. Bayern, money line, plus 139 for myself and the Queen. Uh, both teams have scored over two and a half at minus 120. Looks like a good way to go as well. Sliverin says, Flash is an Arsenal hater. And I know you're only joking. I'm not an Arsenal hater. I just I just think there's different levels of, of plays and I've got them down below Man City. Uh, what do you reckon, Mina? If anything, oh. you've spoke nicely about them. You spoke terribly you about cannot. Bayern, though. <laughs> They've been garbage all season. I mean, uh, Leverkusen have just won the league with five weeks to go, which is always nice because if you followed the Bundesliga, you'd see that everyone had... Uh, but Bayern don't uh, have a number six, cutest. Flash. We should listen to what Tuchel's been saying. <laughs> they, don't have a number, they don't have a manager. That manager would not inspire a drunk man in a brewery. Honest to God, he'd come out sober. Uh, complete joke. Uh, OK, time Z for Q&A. Sorry, mate? He's a Champions League winner. Exactly. How? How? And a finalist before that with are you, are PSG. You, uh, Marco here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Marco here. Are you a too cool fan? <laughs> I'm not necessarily a fan. I just respect that he's, he's, he's won uh, the, the competition we're talking about, which I think deserves I credit. Am. And he schooled, schooled Man City a couple of times, didn't he? So. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't have it. Can't have it. Day-to-day -day running. <laughs> Can't have him. I uh, don't know if anybody... He took PSG, left. who no one can take PSG to a final. And he did it. Did he win? Despite he the win? obstacles. Did he win? No, oh, it was difficult, but he won it afterwards with Chelsea, <laughs> and it was a brilliant win. That is and huge. in the year that Real Madrid reached it, I think the team that gave them the most problems... Did Tuchel take Chelsea. over from Frank Lampard? Who took yes. over from Frank yes. Lampard? Tuchel. Tuchel. See, Lampard did it all. Lampard sure. just uh, oh, said... God. He showed us the best of him at Everton. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's a different one. Anyway, listen, uh, let's go for a quick Q&A if anyone's got anything they want to say or type. Then now's the time to do it. Why I ask you to please subscribe. And also, maybe a little thumbs up shows a bit of appreciation. Uh, if you ring the bell, that means we'll notify you and you'll never miss any content again. And we love to give things away here at BetUS. So please type in betustv.com forward slash odds. And there's going to be odds props offers and bonuses they are just waiting for you uh okay there's uh derek says lewandowski anytime scorer plus 130 doesn't play for bayern yeah. anymore derek doesn't play for bayern he no. plays uh a barcelona no no not for me as I think for vinnie jr i don't know because of kyle walker it worries me um i see it more being rodrigo or bellingham to be honest with you yeah or, or rudiger it could be anyone because you know that Man City can concede a goal from anyone. You could see an own goal as well. Uh, okay, let's have but a I would look still, at... But I would still always take a punt on Vinny. Just, just yeah, we'll out. just do what, do what Marco Hare's done. <laughs> Man City to win and both teams to score at like plus 225. Looks like a nice 3-1, 4-1. Um, producer, let's have a little bit of the best bets, please, sir. And what a great job you've done. <laughs> As uh, as as the old basketball best bets come up. OK, uh, <laughs> Mina says Barcelona, PSG, Kylian Mbappe, anytime goal scorer at plus 110. Man City, Real Madrid, both teams score on over two and a half at plus 105. And Bayern money line for myself and for Mina at plus 139. Atletico double chance at minus 145 as they go on the road to Dortmund. PSG to score twice is minus 110. And Man City to be leading at half time is plus 126. 
six. Mark O'Hare has gone with both teams to score and over three and a half cards in the Barcelona PSG game at minus 120. Man City and both teams to score. A very tasty plus 225. And Bayern and Arsenal, both teams to score and over two and a half at minus 120. Uh, Regalon says Arsenal to win. What, in the Premier League this weekend? Or are we talking about Bayern? Uh, OK, uh, Mina, look forward to seeing you on Thursday for Serie A. Mark O'Hare, I'll see you on the Premier League show, 10 o'clock Eastern on Thursday, where I know you're going to have a little bit of... Uh, gun did for your presenter who took Manchester United on the road last week, but I did take him draw no bet. But... I do admit they should have been beaten by five. OK, enjoy Champions League. Make sure you join us tomorrow for the Europa League with Pavlos and with Alex. And if you like your MLS, it debuts tomorrow here on the Bet US TV. So make sure you give them all the support in the world. May all your bets be winners. You take care. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, hit the like, subscribe and ring the bell and we will notify you and you'll never miss a show again. For all of the sports content here at BetUS, then type in betustv.com. Let's cash together.